The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Monstrous Regiment, featuring a roundtable of Dominion women seeking to honor Jesus Christ in applying God's Word fearlessly and faithfully in all callings and seasons of life, both in and out of the home, reversing the curse and smashing pagan strongholds. So does the Bible require a rape victim to marry her attacker? There are plenty of people who will tell you that the answer is yes. But as we'll see, the truth is quite different. I'm Susanna Roundtree with the Monstrous Regiment podcast, and today I'd like to take a look at what exactly the Bible does say about rape and why the concept of consent ought to be foundational to how Christians think about all human relationships, not just the ones between men and women. Needless to say, this episode is going to talk about rape, so if that brings up painful memories for you, you may like to try tune out for this one. So let's talk about the commonly repeated lie that the Bible says a woman who has been raped should be married to her attacker. And I call it a lie because it really is nothing less. Um, it's the complete opposite of the truth. Uh, the passage which people will point to in support of this is Deuteronomy 22 verses 28 to 29, which reads as follows. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he has humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. Now, it might be tempting for many of us to brush this aside by saying, well, that was the law of the ancient Israelites, and it's got nothing to do with Christians today. Um, however, Paul was surely speaking of the Old Testament when he told Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So sure, um, the Apostle Paul didn't approve of anyone returning to the Old Testament shadows, which had been replaced by the light of Jesus Christ. That's what the whole book of Galatians is about. And we're no longer required to observe those parts of the law which pointed forward to Jesus Christ, such as temple sacrifices, circumcision as a sign of the covenant, uh, laws against hybridization, celebrations like Passover or tabernacles. Um, those were the shadows, and now we have the light. In Colossians, Paul refers to these laws when he writes, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The author of Hebrews agreed with this when he wrote that the old covenant priests, quote, serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So now that we have the light of Jesus Christ, we mustn't revert to the Old Testament shadows. But there's more to the Old Testament than just ceremonial shadows administered by the priests from 24 to Jesus Christ. There are also civil laws which have largely to do with criminal justice. And the Bible is very clear about how important justice is to God. I would recommend just searching the word justice in your Bible sometime and just reading all the verses that come up. Um, for example, in Psalm 89, we're told that justice and righteousness are the foundations of God's throne. That is, if God ever failed to do justice, his very throne would crumble. Uh, Proverbs 21 says, To do justice and righteousness is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, Of the increase of Christ's government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with righteousness and justice forever. And then you've got the Micah mandate that tells us to love mercy and do justice. So if you read scripture, you'll find that there's almost nothing that the Lord is more concerned about on this earth than justice. So it's no surprise to find that as part of his instructions to his old covenant people, he included multiple rules of civil justice. We know that God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. So it makes sense that his justice wouldn't change either between the old covenant and the new. In fact, that's what we find when we look at how the judicial law is mentioned in the New Testament. In 1 in 1 Timothy, Paul writes, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, the murderers, the sexually immoral, 
men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So notice how Paul says that there is a lawful use for the Old Testament law. And he specifically links that use to matters of criminal justice and social order. He says that using the law in this way is fully, quote, in accordance with the gospel. So going to the Old Testament for insights on how to deal with crimes such as rape is something that I think every New Covenant believer should be doing. This means that when we look at a passage like Deuteronomy 22, the one thing we can't do is lightly say that it no longer applies to us. We serve a God of justice who wants to see justice done on the earth and who has given us some explicit rules for how to deal with crime and misconduct. Since God defines justice, then if we ignore God's law, we actually risk doing horrible injustice to other people. And strangely enough, the topic of rape is one where I think Christians would do well to pay attention to what the law actually says. So let's reread the Deuteronomy 22 passage, except this time I'll give it a bit more context, and I'm going to start three verses earlier in Deuteronomy 22 verse 25. And I would recommend looking this up in your Bible so as to follow along. Reading from the King James. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel you shall do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbour and slays him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he has humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. Okay. So the first thing to note about this passage is that when the Bible does provide for a girl to marry a man who has taken advantage of her, the situation being described is not rape. We can tell this because verses 25 to 27 actually do describe a rape, and the text specifically says that if a man forces the woman to lie with him, the crime is tantamount to murder, and the victim is every bit as innocent. The primary area of difference between the two provisions is that in the first one, in verses 25 to 27, the woman has not given consent, so she is entirely blameless for what has happened. In the first provision, a man who forces a woman against her consent is put to death. And in the second provision, nothing is said about the woman's consent being violated, and the man does not die. So that alone should be enough to prove that we're looking at two radically different offences here. And that the point of difference has everything to do with the woman's consent or lack thereof. I think it's also important to note it note that the uh, the wording used in these two provisions is different when we're speaking about how the man handles the woman. Um, some Bible translations don't make a difference. For example, the ESV translates both words as seize, and the words do have some similarities, but I looked up the original Hebrew, and I think the King James Version cues a bit closer to the original when it translates one word as force and the other as lay hold on. So uh, in verses 25 to 27, the rape provision, the Hebrew word translated force is the word chazak. It's the same word which is used in Exodus to describe Pharaoh hardening his heart, and we see it again when Amnon rapes his sister Tamar in 2 Samuel chapter 3, 13. So by contrast, the word translated as lay hold on her in verses uh, 28 to 29 is taphas, which can potentially be gentler. For instance, it can be used to describe scholars who handle the law, and it's not used to describe rape elsewhere in the Bible. So in case you're looking at the ESV, the words are not the same. Now, I mentioned that the difference between these two provisions has to do with a woman's consent. You've probably noticed another difference, which is that in verses 25 to 27, uh, the rape provision, the woman is engaged to be married, while in the second she's single. So why was this relevant? Well, one answer which I think a lot of people would be tempted to give would be that maybe the Bible sees a woman's sexuality as belonging to her husband. So if a man rapes or seduces a married or engaged woman, that's a crime primarily against her husband, current or future. <clears throat> and it's punishable more harshly than if she was single. And there are actually both unbelievers and Christians who will argue for this, but I don't believe it's the truth. 
So why isn't it the truth? Because in verse 26, it explicitly compares rape to murder. It explicitly says that rape is just like murder, and obviously the person being attacked is the woman. It says, For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slays him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and there was none to save her. So the woman's fiancé is not the victim here. He's not even mentioned. She is the murder victim. And I believe that this comparison to murder is here to prevent us from making a category error. The other provisions in this passage are all about sexual misconduct between consenting parties, adultery and fornication. Only verses 25 to 27 deal with the crime of rape, that is, with non-consensual sex. And God stops us and says, by the way, don't get the idea that this is a mere sexual misdemeanor. It's a crime of violence and power with far more to do with murder than it has to do with sex. If it was a sexual misdemeanor, she would have consented. And the fact that she didn't consent puts this crime on a different level. Not only that, but for reasons we'll go into in more depth later, the Bible is pretty clear that although a husband has a certain measure of authority over his wife's body, a wife has equal authority over her husband's body. And that authority, as the whole of scripture testifies, is given only for the purpose of loving and serving and sacrificing for one another. In the Old Testament, this worked out practically in the fact that both husbands and wives were equally empowered to sue their spouse for adultery. Women in scripture are not property, so it wouldn't make sense in, con in context with the rest of scripture if this passage about rape was aimed primarily at penalising one man for trespassing on another man's property. So why does the passage mention a betrothed woman? Well, there are a number of different possibilities. One possibility is that the passage is trying to emphasise the woman's refusal to consent to what's happening. You know, she's engaged to someone else. Obviously, she's not consenting to being raped by a third party. Uh, another possibility is that since the laws of the Old Testament seem to have been developed as rulings, handed down in specific cases um, that came before Moses' judgment seat, that um, whatever case prompted this judgment had to do with a betrothed woman. Uh, a third explanation is that this particular provision is given in context with a number of passages that deal out different penalties depending on the marital status of the people involved, and that the relevance of marital status in the Old Testament is actually one of those shadows of Old Testament law that was abrogated by the coming of Christ. Uh, in the Old Testament, there were many provisions directed towards keeping the various different Israelite uh, tribal bloodlines separate and distinct because it had been prophesied that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. So engaging in activity that was likely to bring about um, a confusion of the various different genealogies was a big deal. Um, and that could be why we see such a distinction drawn in this passage between married and unmarried women. What shouldn't be debatable is that the major ethical dis distinction in this passage is the whole issue of consent. So when we move on to verses 28 to 29, and we read of God telling a girl who's lost her virginity to marry the guy, we need to put this into perspective. This is not a rape victim being sold to her attacker for the rest of her life. If he'd raped her, he couldn't marry her because in a biblical commonwealth he would probably be dead. His crime would be treated like murder. So what's actually in here, view here in verses 28 to 29 is something like the situation in Pride and Prejudice with Lydia Bennett and Mr. Wickham, where a girl consents to having sex out of wedlock with a man, and he is forced to marry her without the option of divorce, not to punish her, but so that she and her children will be provided with a respectable home for the rest of their lives. You've got to remember, ancient Israel was an agricultural society, and it would have been even more difficult for a single mother to make ends meet than it is today, or even in Lydia Bennett's day. Now, <coughs> I just finished reading Pride and Prejudice, and... Here's a noticeable difference between the two situations. In Pride and Prejudice, Lydia's friends have to pay Mr. Wickham a lot of money to make him marry her. It's their responsibility to help him to provide her with a comfortable home. That was how marriage settlements worked in 18th century England, but it wasn't how they worked in ancient Israel. In Israel, the dowry was paid by the prospective husband to the parents of the girl, and there's evidence that the money was then handed over to the girl as property of her very own. Uh, Rushduni explains this in the Institutes of Biblical Law, Volume 1. He says, The dowry was an important part of marriage. We meet it first in Jacob, who worked seven years for Laban to earn a dowry for Rachel. The pay for this service belonged to the bride as her dowry, 
and Rachel and Leah could indignantly speak of themselves as having been, quote, sold by their father because he had withheld from them their dowry. And you can look that up in Genesis 31, verses 14 and 15. This is another thing about this law which everyone gets wrong, of course. So they say the seducer is buying the girl from her father when in fact he's settling that money on her so that she will always be provided for. Um, Exodus 22, verse 16 to 17 um, is also very interesting to look at in conjunction with this passage. We know that um, the word Deuteronomy means the second law, that is, it was a recapitulation of, and an expansion of much of what was said in Exodus. And this passage makes it clear, Exodus 22, 16 to 17, makes it clear that the payment of the dowry was compulsory, but the marriage was not. This passage reads, If a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. Now, for reasons we'll get into later in this episode, I should note that it would be a mistake to see the reference to the father's consent as making the girl's consent to the marriage irrelevant. But the seducer had to give the girl a dowry. And so if she and her family agreed to the marriage, then well and good. But if she did not agree, he still had to pay up. She would then bring a dowry twice as large into any future marriage, which would help to compensate for any perceived loss of social worth that might have come from her no longer being a virgin. And yes, there are a lot of laws about debt collection in the Old Testament. So she would have been quite able to get the money out of her seducer, even if he'd had to do what Jacob did and work as an indentured servant for several years. So one more thing to note is that when Deuteronomy 22 verse 28 to 29 provides that a seducer can never divorce his wife, that is a one-way street. Uh, she might still divorce him on the usual terms, uh, infidelity or withholding financial provision or sex, but he can't divorce her. So, so no, in conclusion, no, the Old Testament did not provide for a girl to marry a rapist. What it actually did was provide her with financial security, regardless of whether she chose to marry him or not. So now that we've explained verses 28 to 29, I want to take a bit of a closer look at what the Old Testament does say about rape in verses 25 to 27. If a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel you shall do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man rises against his neighbour and slays him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So we've already covered the clear indications that this passage deals with non-consensual sex as a crying town to mount to murder. It's 100% the man's fault, and since it can be prosecuted as far as the death penalty, it pretty much rules out the woman being forced to marry him. I should note, by the way, um, under biblical law, the victim of a crime has a great deal of discretion in prosecuting her case. The concept of a victim in biblical law is very specific, since all crimes are primarily crimes against God. Then the victim of a crime becomes God's representative in seeking justice. So a woman who was being raped would have a great deal of discretion in prosecuting her rapist, and the death penalty, while definitely on the cards, should be seen as the maximum penalty. If she chose not to seek that, then she would be able to recover the price of a dowry, as well as medical expenses under biblical laws having to do with violent assault. If a first-time offender was let off so lightly, he would have to take care not to repeat his offence because the death penalty also applied um, under biblical law to incorrigible or habitual criminals. But back to this um, passage, it also contains some interesting procedural guidelines. Um, I might note as an aside that there's no statute of limitations on this passage. And in fact, as far as I'm aware, there's no statute of limitations anywhere in Old Testament law. But let me get right to the point. This provision is insistent about the rape taking place in, quote, the field. So this carries over from previous verses in this chapter where a betrothed or married woman is presumed to be guilty of adultery if she, if she engages in sexual activity in a populated area and fails to call for help. So clearly these provisions are basically about consent. A woman's blame was to be determined according to whether or not she had um, given her consent as evidenced by whether she'd called for help. If she was attacked in a densely populated area like an ancient city where people live pretty much on top of their neighbours, then if she was able to call for help, she had the responsibility to do so. 
However, God didn't just stop there. He also provided for cases where sexual assault happens without the presence of witnesses. This aspect of the passage has been pretty controversial, and I can tell why. Uh, one of the foundational principles of Old Testament evidence law is that it takes at least two or three witnesses to prove a case, especially where someone's life may be at stake. No one can be put to death except on the evidence of uh, a mul multiple number of witnesses. So this verse and this crime is the sole exception to this rule. It un unambiguously allows for a man to be prosecuted and condemned even to death on the witness of one single woman, which is pretty revolutionary for the ancient world where women usually couldn't give evidence in court at all. Now, before everyone starts looking nervous, let me quickly lay out what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that some random woman could just show up at court and accuse some poor guy of raping her in the countryside and get him executed. Um, this particular passage of the law is focused on consent, and presently I'm of the opinion that it is this specific element, her consent, which the woman's unsupported evidence is intended to prove. Uh, for instance, as I see it, she would still have to prove that sexual activity occurred and that the accused man was the one with whom that activity took place. What she doesn't have to prove is whether or not she consented to what happened. There is to be no he said, she said. The court must take her word for it. And the accused man's only defence would be to prove, with multiple witnesses, that she could have got help but chose not to. And as a parenthesis, this ties into a general principle of Old Testament law, which is its care for the weaker or disadvantaged, which we see in the constant emphasis on protecting widows, orphans, and foreigners. We can thus see that there's biblical foundation for the concept of statutory rape, that is, sexual activity with a child would also, of course, be prohibited under biblical law because the child is a weaker party who, by definition, cannot render full consent, which is biblically defined as consent that can be freely withheld. So you could summarise one of the legal principles at play here as follows. In any case where the weaker party was incapable of withholding sexual consent if she wished, then it's presumed that no consent was given. And here's a second uh, axiom. In any case where there were not witnesses and the participants disagree about whether consent was given, then you believe whatever the weaker party says. End of story. If a woman says that what happened to her happened against her will, you believe her. I hope that I'm managing to paint a picture of biblical law as you might not have thought of it before, as a vast interconnected web that goes far beyond the specific legal provisions in the Pentateuch. Biblical law can't be woodenly interpreted without reference to the full counsel of God. What I want to do in this next part of the episode is I want to step back a little from the issue of rape and look at the concept of consent as it's developed throughout the whole of scripture. So the dictionary defines consent as one person's voluntary and willing agreement to the desires or suggestions of another. Consent is individual. Under normal circumstances, no other person can give it on your behalf. It must be free and unconstrained. Any kind of influence or coercion will prevent real consent being given. That's how consent is defined in law, but I believe the concept has deep roots in Christian doctrine. Let's read Matthew 22, verses 35 to 40. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to tempt him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And these two commandments, as we know, are a basic summary of the Ten Commandments, and the first of the Ten Commandments begin like this. I am the Lord thy God, which, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. So in scripture, God reveals himself as a transcendent authority far above every other authority, divine or human. His holiness is such that a mediator is required to communicate his will to mankind, and to take the penalty for their sins so that they can approach God without being consumed by his perfect justice. This mediator is God himself in the presence in the person of Jesus Christ, and there is no other. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. So not only is there no God but God, but there is no mediator between man and God apart from Jesus. Moreover, Jesus promised us 
that when he departed from this earth, he would send his Holy Spirit to dwell in each of us personally. So practically speaking, what this means for Christians is that we are answerable first and foremost to God. No human can claim our loyalty to the same extent. No human can mediate between us and God, only Christ. And we don't need any help in approaching God or in hearing his voice, so long as we're covered with the blood of Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit. So that means we have only one authority in our lives. We have only one mediator with that authority. And we have personal and direct spiritual access to that authority. That's what we Protestants mean when we talk about the priesthood of all believers. Now, it's true that God puts other authorities into our lives parents, employers, church elders, or magistrates, but God also makes it clear that those authorities only exist in this life. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24, we read that at the end of history, Jesus will put down all rule and authority and power but his own. Parents only have coercive authority over their children when those children are infants, when they are incapable of ruling themselves. It's not a giant leap to say that if you can't disciple your children into godly self-government in about 15 or 20 years, then you failed as a parent. Similarly, in the church and state, coercive authority is only meant for those adults too immature to self-govern, those who fail to control their desires to steal, kill, or rape. The clear biblical ideal is that we should no longer need external control because we will have God's word written on our hearts and his Holy Spirit living within us. Now, all this may seem unrelated to the idea of consent, but in fact, it's basic to the concept. Consent is the unconstrained choice of an individual. If we really believe in the priesthood of all believers, if we really believe that the biblical ideal is individual self-government directly under God with external authorities only getting involved in flagrant breaches of self-government, then it soon appears that free individual consent is basic to all human relationships whether in entering marriage, in transacting business, or in deciding what medical treatment to undergo. The only alternative to a consent-based society is coercion. And after studying God's law on and off for my whole life, I've come to the conclusion that God only sanctions coercion as a limited means of reinstating his justice when someone has proved unwilling to or incapable of governing themselves. So remember the second greatest commandment? It's to love our neighbours as ourselves. Given the first commandment, one of the most important ways we can love our neighbours is by serving them in love rather than coercing and exploiting one another. This is why Christians need to stand up for freedom of consent, whether it's in sexual matters or in the many other areas where our consent is violated every day. Um, Under God's law, people have the right to consent or to withhold consent from things like compulsory school attendance, compulsory vaccinations, compulsory voting laws, compulsory church membership, or compulsory anything else. Galatians 5 verse 13. For you are called to freedom, brothers, and we do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So the Bible's teaching is clear. Christian liberty to serve one another through love. And here is where we cycle back into sexual ethics, because as it turns out, the New Testament has some very specific things to say about sexual consent. First of all, we're told not to use our freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Just as in the Old Testament, it grieves God if we use our freedom of consent to commit fornication or adultery. That implicates us in sin, but it doesn't implicate us in sin if we withheld our consent to it. Second, we're told in the in the New Testament that marriage is a matter of consent. In 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39 we read, A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. So this is why, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that we shouldn't adhere to a wooden reading of the Old Testament provisions about a father giving or withholding his permission for his daughter's marriage. Uh, In New Testament times, if not earlier, women are part of the priesthood of all believers, with the Christian liberty to marry whom they wish, only in the Lord. Now, given that the Old Testament had the Aaronic priesthood of a few, and given that Paul's declaration of a woman's freedom to marry whom she likes is something of a departure from the Old Testament language of women being given in marriage, I'm open to an interpretation that says there was less Holy Spirit-inspired maturity and self-government in the Old Testament times than there is now, and therefore fathers exercised more authority over their adult daughters. That said, the Spirit of the Lord definitely came upon women in the Old Testament, 
just look at Sarah, Rebecca, Hannah, Huldah the prophetess, and the unnamed prophetess who was married to Isaiah. And I don't accept that a godly daughter of an ungodly man would ever be justified in obeying her father rather than God in the Old Testament any more than in the New Testament. As it says in Ecclesiastes, better is a poor but wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. So when read in the light of all of scripture, it's clear that if Old Testament law gives specific decisions to fathers, that is not intended to abrogate but rather to enforce the woman's personal decision. Third, the New Testament shows that even sexual activity inside marriage is a matter of consent. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 3 to 5 is pretty clear on this topic. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may demote that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So Paul tells spouses not to abstain from sex except for a limited time with the consent of both parties. He also lays down the principle that in marriage, spouses have authority over each other's bodies. Now, of course, in context, Paul is talking about abstaining from sex, not having it. Evidently, the big temptation for the Corinthian church was asceticism. But the principle here goes beyond the specific issue that Paul was addressing. My married friends tell me that there are times when intimacy just isn't appropriate or comfortable for them. Um, one rather extreme example that comes to mind is a friend of mine who was uh, abused as a child and as a teen. And she tells me that the memories occasionally make it difficult for her to be intimate with her husband. So Paul tells us that spouses have authority over each other's bodies, and the clear implication is that if I have authority over someone's body, then I have authority over what that body may do to, it, to my body. That said, in addition, kindness is obviously a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and I'm pretty sure that marital rape doesn't fit into the picture of self-sacrificial self -sacrificial servant leadership, where husbands are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Um, that is not loving your neighbor as yourself. And that is really the broader context here in which um, the rest of scripture needs to be interpreted. So as I've mentioned a couple of times already, I really believe the law of God needs to be read in the context of all of scripture. I am a theonomist, which means that I believe in the abiding validity of certain aspects of the Old Testament judicial laws. I should hasten to add that while I've spent a lot of time studying up on this area, my knowledge is limited. Um, far more theonomic studies and commentaries have been written than I have had the opportunity to read. And even given the body of work already produced, I'm pretty convinced that theonomic study is still in its infancy. Give it a few hundred years and a few thousand more books, and I think we'll have a chance of approaching maturity on this topic. But I hope that what I've had to say in this podcast has laid the foundations for a beginning of a good biblical understanding of this topic. No matter whether you subscribe to theonomy or not, I hope that having listened to this, you now have a greater appreciation for how Old Testament works in concert with the rest of Scripture, and how it was designed to provide life and liberty to the oppressed. I'm Susanna Roundtree, and thank you for listening to The Monstrous Regiment. Thank you for listening to The Monstrous Regiment. We hope this podcast inspires and equips you to go and exercise dominion for Christ's kingdom. Terrible as an army with banners. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.